At University of Virginia Health System, we're for bringing advanced care closer to home. So we're bringing health knowledge directly to you with UVA Health System Radio. Here's Melanie Cole. Chronic total occlusion is a potentially serious heart condition that sometimes has no symptoms. My guest today is Dr. Michael Rogasta. He's a board certified in cardiovascular disease and interventional cardiology. His specialties include coronary artery disease and chronic total occlusion. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rogasta. Let's start by telling the listeners a little bit about coronary artery disease and some of the things that go along with it. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, as you know, coronary artery disease is a very common condition, and essentially there's plaque in one or more of the coronary arteries. That plaque may obstruct or limit the blood flow in the coronary artery, and that can cause symptoms such as chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, fatigue, and of course it can lead to heart attack and other more serious problems down the line. Are there certain risk factors for coronary artery disease as a whole, and then we'll speak about chronic total occlusion. Yes. So you should first consider chronic total occlusion as a subset of coronary disease. That's uh, the, the nature of it is a, it's a total occlusion of the artery instead of just a narrowing to some percentage, and it's been there for a long time. So that's what is meant by a chronic total occlusion. And as a subset of coronary artery disease, it has the same risk factors as um, patients with other less severe forms of coronary artery disease, and that includes high cholesterol, smoking history, diabetes, uh, hypertension, and, of course, family history. So those are the important risk factors that lead to uh, coronary artery disease. So speak about chronic total occlusion as a subset of coronary artery disease. And you mentioned symptoms, some of the symptoms you might experience, but often Sometimes you don't experience these. How would you even know if you have coronary artery disease? Um, that's a great question. And a lot of people, it is asymptomatic. For a lot of those folks, it's asymptomatic because it's not causing a particular problem with the blood flow. So it's a very prevalent condition, uh, but in a lot of folks who don't have symptoms and don't have any um, serious sequela from the blockages there, we just treat that medically with um, the goal to be treat the risk factors that might lead to progression. So it's really only when the disease becomes more severe and is obstructing blood flow and leading to some of the symptoms that we would then recommend more aggressive treatment, which are the uh, revascularization procedures such as stenting or coronary bypass surgery. And how is it diagnosed, Dr. Rogasta? Is this something you have to go in and have an angiogram to figure it out, or can you tell by what they're experiencing? Well, the symptoms will lead you to then probe more deeply, and usually the first line of diagnosis is a stress test, which shows you essentially the effect that these blockages may have on the circulation of the heart uh, in terms of how the heart is functioning or how the pattern of blood flow appears on an image that's done non-invasively. Uh, if that test comes back normal, then usually we treat that medically and, again, treat the risk factors for coronary disease. However, if the stress test does show evidence of lack of blood flow uh, to the heart, then we would go to a more invasive approach like a coronary angiogram, uh, which is a type of a cardiac catheterization procedure. And that is considered the gold standard for diagnosing blockages in the coronaries because we can see the artery in fine detail and know exactly how blocked it is, um, and then that usually leads to how we would then treat from the, the angiogram. So speak about treatment then. What would be the first line of defense if you've performed these exams and you've determined that there is a total blockage, then what? So it depends on how severe the patient's symptoms are and how much it's affecting the blood flow to the heart. In some patients who have a chronically occluded artery, um, it leads to minimal or no symptoms, and there's adequate blood flow to the heart because the heart actually creates what's called collateral channels, which are essentially a rerouting of the circulation around the blockage, so your heart does that by itself. If that's adequate, and in, in other words, if there's adequate blood flow to the heart through these collaterals, then we just treat the risk factors and treat medically uh, those patients. However, if 
the symptoms are not controlled medicines or if there's really a large area of the heart muscle not getting blood flow during stress, then we would warrant more aggressive treatments. Chronic occlusions have historically been very difficult to treat with the, the catheter-based techniques like angioplasty and stenting. However, recently, in the last maybe five to ten years, there have been great advances uh, in the percutaneous treatment of, of chronic total occlusions that have led to greater successes. Uh, and so our success rate now is in the 80 to 90 percent range for a chronically occluded artery to be able to successfully open that using a catheter-based technique, whereas historically it was in the only 40 to 50 percent range. Isn't that amazing that the heart can actually make that collateral circulation? It always fascinates me. Now, what about after the procedure? What kind of lifestyle does that patient have afterward, and what can they expect as far as their ability to exercise and conduct normal life? Yes, if they were pretty symptomatic before the procedure and were successful in restoring the blood flow, then usually we see a great improvement in their ability to exercise, in their exercise tolerance, and their uh, symptom control. And, and many patients that we've been successful have had resolution of their angina, which is the chest pain syndrome that you typically get with uh, a chronic total occlusion, or their shortness of breath syndrome, which also may be a manifestation of the chronic occlusion. So usually if they're very symptomatic, they get a lot of symptom relief with, um, with this and are able to exercise more and then able to do the more healthy things they need to do to maintain um, their, their health over a long time. What about it coming back? Does that happen in that area that you've cleared out? I mean, Just if there's like, a stent in yeah. there, does that mean it's not going to close up again? No, unfortunately. And just like a stent placed uh, for a less severe stenosis, uh, a stent can, uh, the blockage can recur in the stent. Now, it is a different process. It tends to be scar tissue related rather than the atherosclerosis buildup that started the process in the first place. Um, however, those can often be treated successfully with an additional procedure. And you know, at the end of the day, if the, the stent procedures fail and they do recur, there's always the option of coronary bypass surgery, um, which is also a uh, treatment option for these patients if we're unsuccessful in able to open their artery. In just the last few minutes, Dr. Rogasta, why should patients with chronic, chronic total occlusion come to UVA Heart and Vascular Center for their care? Um, well, a couple of reasons. I think first we have a really great team approach to patients with complex coronary disease, and this would be a form of complex coronary disease. And what I mean by that is uh, a lot of these patients are evaluated both by the interventional cardiology group, which is the catheter-based techniques, but also by heart surgeons. And we together decide what may be the best option for that patient. So the team approach is, is very, very valuable in giving the patient the best uh, care. In addition, we have a lot of interest in, in uh, managing these types of uh, complex disease and have spent a lot of effort and time learning the special techniques that are needed to be successful um, and uh, what we really focus on this so our success rate is very high. So for those reasons uh, that's a big advantage to coming to the University of Virginia. It sounds like a great multidisciplinary approach to helping those with vascular disease. Thank you so much Dr. Ragasta. You're listening to UVA Health Systems Radio. And for more information, you can go to uvahealth.com. That's uvahealth.com. This is Melanie Cole. Thanks so much for listening.